then you can begin whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm Hugo Pink. Um, I am in my fourth year of my BFA in a painting and drawing focus, as well as a minor in art history. Um, you can move on. <laughs> we can just jump right in. Um, so I just have a few examples of some of the paintings I've done um, in past semesters and other classes in this program. Um, these were both from like the more of the intro painting course where we did um, a lot of still life studies. And that was kind of the first time of me kind of doing that um, with paint. I usually would draw still lives. So this was kind of a fun new experience for myself. Um, yeah, so you can go to the next one. And then currently I am in a the figure painting course. And this is also the first time that I have really um, painted from real life figures like this. So another big learning experience for myself. Um, I'm enjoying it a lot. And I think with each painting that I do in this course, um, I'm just learning a lot and becoming better at like local color and just um, proportions and stuff. So that's very enjoyable as well. Um, I'm really enjoying kind of exploring more um, abstracted color within my pieces as well, um, especially with like color from different colored lights and like bounce light on the skin and fabrics. I think that's really interesting. So I enjoy capturing that a lot in my work. Uh, you can move on. So this is a piece I'm working on. These are kind of like progress um, photos so far of a uh, self-portrait that I'm working on for the same uh, figure painting course. And um, the prompt is kind of open-ended, just kind of um, us doing what we would like to do for our self-portrait. And um, so for mine, it's kind of a narrative on um, surgery and health struggles that I've had. Um, I've had a lot of different abdominal surgeries throughout my life. And so I'm kind of like cradling my own stomach while holding a knife and just kind of um, different symbolism in the background with like the drawing that's on the wall and the uh, plant and stuff. And then if you click, it'll show like uh, updated. So this is the most recent photograph that I have of it. Um, it's kind of wet, so it's a little shiny in this photo, but um, I think so far so good. Um, I am enjoying capturing like the shadows within the wall and the plants and just kind of exploring a much more traditional depiction of a figure as well. And I think it's going good. I'm enjoying it. You can go to the next one. So then um, these are some drawings that I have done. Um, the black and gray one that was in 2D design that was a long time ago. Um, that's kind of a self-portrait where it's like my hand and I and um, just like intermixed with other natural elements, you know, and then um, the colorful one that was, uh, I collect those mushroom pieces and I wanted to kind of start a series of drawing each of them with like different flowers and stuff. So that's kind of the first and that topic, but that's just for fun. It wasn't in any class or anything. I'm just kind of enjoying playing with color and um, light and shadow in drawing. Next slide, please. So these are the drawings that were in the Crossing Over exhibition. Um, these were both done in like the intro drawing course um, with one being like a from a photograph um, 
the charcoal one is from a photograph that I took of a ceramic piece that I did and just kind of like zooming in and I enjoy how it's so um like vast and architectural it almost feels like you're looking up at the ceiling of something and like mm -hmm. there's like wires hanging down and stuff so I really love that piece and then the other one is kind of another exploration of different architectural um elements and design and I love that one as well I think like it's I tend to have a really heavy design focus even though I am kind of technically in a more traditional um focus of painting and drawing but I enjoy that a lot next slide please Um, so with painting and drawing, I'm also interested in printmaking. So this is some uh, silkscreen prints that I've done. In uh, this is my uh, soup cat design, um, and I was just playing around with a lot of different effects that you can get from screen printing, like with the kind of two tone green one, and then like uh, the central one that was just kind of like a bunch of different colors squeezed directly onto the um, silk screen over the paper and um, I just enjoy kind of like that graphic like almost sticker like um, quality to the designs that I do for my prints. Next slide. Um, this is a linoleum cut print that I did of an eastern red bat. I did that for the um, intro to printmaking course and um, I love animals. I really like depicting animals in my artwork. And so I love bats as well. So I just thought that a bat would be a cool print. And I've actually, um, I'm working on another series of more bats right now for um, the art and ecology course. So I'm really excited about that as well. Next slide. So again, for the printmaking course, we did mud stencils, which is um, a form of printmaking with using mud so that it's like environmentally friendly. Um, so these are some snails that I did on campus. Um, some of the snails are my own pet snails and um, I love snails a lot. So I just was really enjoying kind of creating these almost monumental um, pieces kind of dedicated to them because I feel like snails deserve more recognition. <laughs> um, but yeah, I found that really fun. And then again, just like um, playing around with kind of a more graphic design-based quality um, and new mediums as well. Next slide. Um, along with 2D pieces, I'm also a 3D artist. So currently I am in the, um, the molds and multiples course where we do slip casting. And um, so I made this teapot out of um, pumpkins and a pomegranate. And they were in the uh, craft show at Kenilworth Square East like a few weekends ago. And so the left photo is the, what was in the show and the right was me finally getting um, the decals of the plants that I put on them. So I'm really pleased with how it's come out. And I really do enjoy doing ceramics a lot, probably equally as much as drawing and painting now. Next slide. These are just some more vessels that I've made. Um, these were in the wheel throwing course. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's um, more of these. It's kind of a four piece set of jars that I made, which um, I really enjoy wheel throwing a lot. I love that course a lot. And I feel like if you can take it, you should because it's super fun. Next slide, please. These are just some more examples of what I made in that class as well. Did a lot of mugs and bowls and just, uh, we were just cranking out work. You know, I made uh, 
I made like so much, uh, so many uh, containers and vessels and just everything in that course. And it's just like really fun and experimental. Next slide. Oh, wow. um, and then along with ceramics, I also enjoy sculpture. I kind of do a lot of things for sure. Um, this is a sculpture. It's probably about like nine inches tall, um, completely made out of paper um, of a tiny tree house. Um, this was for 3D concepts and I actually took it at the West Bend campus a long time ago. Um, and this actually was during COVID, like right when COVID happened during that semester, we had to switch from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to online. So it was just kind of a move from doing like pieces that we had like access to equipment to like stuff that we could access ourselves. So it was much smaller scale, but I enjoyed um, kind of playing around with scale and like, um, kind of going from enjoying doing such big pieces to kind of toning it back and like focusing on the details, which I think was really helpful to my work. Next slide, please. <laughs> this is um, a self-portrait sculpture that I did. Um, you can see I casted my face and my ears and kind of narrative wise, I kind of picture it of like me being almost like a cyborg who got their head ripped off. And um, it's like whoever ripped off my head has kept it as like a trophy on the stand. Um, so it's plaster head, the cords are just cords from Goodwill, you know, that I did an oil wash on with oil paint to weather it and then the base is made of metal with a patina on it so I got to learn like a uh, plaster you know and then like some metal stuff as well like cutting and welding metal which was really exciting for me. Next slide. And then I thought these were fun as well. I took the intro to fibers course and I enjoyed it and I learned a lot from it, but I don't think I will be a fibers artist forever. <laughs> it took, um, it takes a long time and a lot of skill and um, I enjoy what I made from that class. But like I said, it's like, it's painstaking for sure. Um, but yeah, the frog pillow, I love him. He's on my bed and I dyed the fabric and um, sewed them together myself. So that was like, a rewarding process for sure to kind of make something that's also functional and um yeah <laughs> um and that's it the next slide is just uh my cat <laughs> so um yeah that's kind of just like i just kind of wanted to show a bit of kind of everything that i do um and just kind of show people that even if you are kind of in a drawing and painting focus technically you can still do so much more than that which i really enjoy um so yeah thanks um, so now we can we're in between each artist we're also gonna do like a brief q a so if anybody has any questions for you though that they would like to ask now would be the time I guess I just want to say I love the snails. Uh, Thank you. I illuminated manuscript class last year, and mm -hmm. a lot of snails in those. And that snail piece was the talk of the class. Everybody was talking about it. Oh wow! Um, because we had just read some articles on specifically snails and illuminated manuscripts. So um, yeah, it was kind of cool to see that you were the one who who was responsible for those. Very cool. But I was also just wondering, like, what is the process for getting those, like, on, like, I know you said it was, like, mud, I think you said. Yeah. Um, so basically what, um, what I kind of did for it, um, if you buy, like, 
uh, on Amazon, there's like, you can buy clear plastic sheeting. And um, so what I did was draw in that scale, I drew the snails um, on a piece of black paper actually. And then um, like with like metallic Sharpie. And then um, I taped some of that plastic to the paper and just used an X-Acto knife to cut out the designs. And then I taped them to that wall with um, duct tape. And then um, in like a five gallon bucket, I mixed up water and uh, just like potting soil to make the mud. And then I used a paint roller and kind of like roll in like slap that around inside of the bucket and it kind of um using a paint roller was able to like get that very thin um detailed kind of wash almost of the snails without having to like cake onto the wall and that let it and that was allowed it to kind of last for a long time you think that they faded like way a lot now like you can barely see them anymore they were like, I should have picked a different spot. They were like right in the sun. So I would say if anybody does those stencils, do it in the shade. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a question, but I do uh, want to say that the uh, your piece that's in crossing over the architectural uh, like pen, pen, like the graphic um, piece, mm -hmm. That is what they, like, I was shown as an, a good, like, as, like, the best example of that assignment, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome yeah. to hear. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's drawing, too. Uh, at least I did something like that in drawing, too, and, sh yeah, that was an example of what you should aim for, so. Very cool. Not a I'm question. glad to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No, I just have to tell Hugo that I'm having big guilt right now because my grandmother's entire kitchen, I mean, everything was that mushroom set. Yeah, Mary Mushroom. Yeah, yeah so I collect everything. the Mary Mushroom 1978 Sears Roebuck calendar. I have so much of that shit in my, in just boxes in my basement because I don't have, <laughs> I live in my dad's house, so I can't put it anywhere. And it's just like ruined my life. I got the butter dish for my birthday and I like almost pissed my pants. I was so fucking excited, man. I, I wish I shit. had that whole set to give you right now. Oh my gosh. It would be awesome. If anybody sees it, hit me up. I'll put my Great Instagram. I, I'm going to put my Instagram in the chat for everyone to follow me for my art, but also let me know if you see Mary Mushroom stuff. I want. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Um, if you think of any more questions, feel free to ask them at the end of Alex's presentation, or you, know, you can contact Hugo directly. So we will start with the next presenter, which is Ariel. Hi, sorry, I don't know if you're waiting for me to talk. <laughs> no, I'm trying to find your, uh... there we go. Alrighty, can everybody hear me okay? Just wanted to make sure, okay, great. All right, so hi, um, my name is Ariel Scott and I'm a senior majoring in our education with a concentration in fibers. Um, I'm really excited to be participating in the crossing over exhibition and in this artist talk as well. And um, just wanted to say thanks for coming and listening um, today. Um, so to start off, I attended the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design Myad from um, 2017 to 2020. Um, I uh, took a year off due to um, the pandemic and well, the year off of school due to the pandemic and um, then transferred to UWM. Um, as I prepare to become an art teacher, I'm also can, um, um, continuing to deepen my own individual art practice as a weaver and um, a spinner of yarn mainly. And I really just like to work with anything soft. Okay, you can go to the next slide. All 
All right, so um, I have a really wide variety of inspirations. Um, on the left are two weavings from um, Christy Novotny, which is the top one, and then Christy Madsen, which is below that, um, which show the type of technique I like to incorporate in my work, um, which is like very textures, um, colors, and also which is overshot weaving, um, which is um, when the horizontal strands of the weaving, which is called the weft, are woven on top of another layer of yarn, creating an interesting pattern. Um, I began my college journey as an illustration student at Myad, so a lot of my work is um, inspired by the illustrations I still enjoy creating in my free time. Um, finally, I'm inspired by children's um, literature, such as Kevin Hankey's, um, which is on top, which is Chrysanthemum, um, and um, I, it's, I think it's Ayono I e Mai, um, which is the one below that. She does a lot of really, really good um, uh, children's illustrations. Um, both authors show um, animals in human-like situations, I would say, and use them as a way to express very human emotions, which is a duality I'm really interested in. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is one of my first weavings, which I made during um, the year I took off of school in 2020. Um, I attended a class at the ABK Weaving Center, which is in River West, so it's fairly close to UWM. It's at the um, Gainesland Elementary School. I'd highly recommend if you're interested in weaving. They have all varieties of weaving classes and even new classes, which is knitting too. Um, so I made this at the um, ABK Weaving Center, and this is a sampler that I made to use um, just to like learn different weaving patterns. Um, this, so I um, titled this piece Half Same Mother and was originally one piece, which I cut in half along the, um, it's kind of like, it's right on the top there. It's a, the, that blue and brown line that is bent in the, in the backhand part there. Um, and I hemmed um, to display as two pieces that are separate, but one. Um, a lot of my early work was made to focus on um, technique first and concept second. So I would consider the piece to think about what concepts I could see in it. For this example, I realized that after cutting the piece that the threads were the same, but the size were very different. It reminded me of my sister who I share a mother with, but not a father. So she's my half sister. Um, when I began working with fiber, I focused on memory and familial connections um, and relationships, memories I've had with my family and things I felt and knew as a child. Go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, these pieces are titled Homesick on the left um, and then Face Between the Fear on the right. Um, I've been, I made both these in 2021. You can actually kind of see it. Like this one is right there. <laughs> um, the last, the last piece is actually um, knitted, but I um, added the black pieces woven and sewn in later on to repeat, um, so I represent the um, soft idealized memories we have of our childhood homes and the way um, adulthood can change or ruin those memories in retrospect. Um, the right piece is an example of soft sculptures I create, which I really enjoy um, as a way to bring weaving into 3D and make it just more dynamic. Um, it is also a representation of animal mo motifs, um, both comforting and familial um, shapes that are made a little unsettling or um, unusual by the lack of facial features and lack of identity. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a large scale soft sculpture about, it's about three feet long, I would say, that continues the theme of animal motifs, but having no expression or even identity lists, um, almost as if they're lost or waiting for someone to return. Um, this piece is called He Just Looked Like He Was Sleeping, and it is about my childhood dog. Um, his name is Cookie, and he passed away in 2019 while I was away from home, so I was unable to be there for him as he crossed over, which is, which was a, a, a complex and upsetting way to grieve, I would say. Um, this piece is based off of a comment my stepdad made about how when they um, brought him home to bury him, um, he said he just looked like he was sleeping. Um, a lot of my pieces involve the idea of combining heavier emotional um, themes with the softness and gentleness of stuffed animals um, and childhood and um, that same illustrative style to almost make it easier to deal with. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is a more recent piece from 2022. Um, it was from the spring semester from um, the Woven One class with Kian Ye Cho. Um, it is called um, House and Home, made with a weaving technique called crockbod or um, bound weave. Um, this uh, Scandinavian technique is used to create um, very intricate repeating patterns and designs with none of the warp, which is the vertical strings um, of the weaving showing. So the entire, entire piece looks um, different than other types of weavings, like traditional weavings, I would say. Um, and um, as I continue developing my art, I've had the opportunity to learn really specialized techniques 
that I have really enjoyed um, testing out and putting up my own style into. Um, this allows me to figure out what works best with and um, what I want to convey. So um, here I really enjoyed the shapes and the scenery. Really enjoyed the shapes um, and the I think my voice is ricocheting. Oh, it's good now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I enjoyed, yeah, like I said, the shapes, the scenery that the boundary was able to express, but I also found it hard to create um, beyond landscapes or abstract patterns, um, which is something I have struggled with in trying to meld illustrative and narrative styles um, of my past work with um, more restrictive imagery that you can create with weavings. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is another piece I created in Woven 1 with Kyung Ye in the spring semester. Um, but this is a really good example of where I want my artistic practice to go. On um, this one, this piece is called Bear Dog. And this is an overshot, overshot diptych um, or also a brocade piece. Um, and this piece was my first attempt at to combine um, concrete imagery with weaving. Um, usually people use the tapestry weaving technique, um, which is manually weaving the thread in and out um, to isolate images um, in the weaving rather than using the overshot technique, which is um, what I used here. Um, I personally like um, the overshot technique more than tapestry because it is more like creating a foundational weaving beneath the image that remains, even if the threads creating the imagery were to be pulled out. Um, so like if I pulled out that um, white thread, which creates that bare, that um, brown weaving behind it would still be there, it would still be remaining. Um, you can also use different patterns within the image, whereas um, with tapestry weaving is mostly a plain weave. Um, so you're not just creating an image, you are working with a pattern as well. And rather than trying to apply traditional painting and drawing principles to the weaving, you're working more with the loom and showing its traces and what you create, I would say. Go to the next slide. Um, so my artistic pra um, process is a lot of trial and error, which I would say. So when thinking about new techniques, like using overshot weaving to create images within the threads, um, as I'm doing here in these two pieces, um, I usually have to try them out and see if they work correctly. Um, these are a couple of recent pieces that I am currently working on, a um, series I'm working on um, to try to combine the technique I used in the piece Bear Dog um, to make more complex shapes with more intricate patterns. Um, ideally, my goal will be to create a full narrative scene on a large scale similar to Bear Dog, but more of a scenery, I would say, um, that utilizes this technique, combining many different patterns within each element of the weaving. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is gonna be a um, series I'm creating. Um, I'm working on, so this is to um, three out of the five that I'm doing. I'm doing smaller um, overshot pieces, and then um, I'm gonna be doing two large scenery images. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is where I implement my artistic practice with my um, art education practice as well. Um, so this um, this workshop right here is a current workshop that um, I'm doing with um, Raul Dahl and um, Arts Eco as well with Carrie. And um, we're working with women um, that have experienced trauma with domestic violence and also women that were incarcerated for domestic violence. Um, and we're creating paper. Um, and then we are creating some women that want to do weavings. We can create these weavings to go on top. So I'm doing a workshop with them on just doing some tapestry weaving so they can put these weavings on top of the cards that they make with paper. Go to the next slide. And this is um, a recent lesson I did with um, my art ed class at the moment. So we're um, paired up with a teacher at an elementary school and I'm in secondary, I'm sorry, elementary ed. And um, we had to create a lesson to go with our students and we we're all paired up with different classes. And so um, we had to do this big lesson for the semester and mine was to do this woven community piece. And um, I did this about a month ago and it was such a beautiful day out and I did this piece with them and um, it was an ephemeral piece. And so they um, we had this beautiful loom that was this ironically in the art room, which was amazing. Um, and then the I read this book to them. It was called Nature is an Artist. We read it outside. We all sat in a circle. And um, then we did this ephemeral piece with um, finding um, just different material outside. And we learned what material we can use. And um, yeah, and so they, they just went to town on this thing. It was really fun. They put flowers. And then in the middle is the finalized piece. Um, ideally, I would love to create something that is even more ephemeral, which is the loom would be created out of just outside sticks, but it was a little difficult to find out like large enough outside sticks. So luckily, I mean, this loom was in the art room. So I was like, this is a, uh, very lucky here, but, um, yeah, this is my most recent thing, but yeah.
And that, I think that's the end of it. Yeah, thank you all for listening. There's my website and my Instagram. <laughs> I'll check out some more stuff. Anybody have any questions? Um, I'm just wondering about, <clears throat> are you continuing to stay involved with ABK and are there opportunities for you to uh, build your teaching practice there through their workshops? Um, yeah, I, I've been on, I've been in communication with them a little bit about doing workshop teaching there because they do have the students come down there at the Gainesville Elementary School, which I, I, I've been in back and forth communication with them. They're just trying to find a spot for me to come and help out um, because I think they're just trying to get they were um, closed for a little bit. Yeah. during the pandemic on and off and I think with the school too they were having some issues with them coming down and doing weaving but um I've been communicating with them about hopefully coming there and doing some teaching it'll be really really fun nice. your work is really lovely oh thank you thank you so much this is Glinda Corbin Pardee in fact I know that Ariel is coming to work for us in the craft center next semester as our fiber yeah. lead so I'm very excited by that so That's fun to see great. your work. Congrats, Ariel. Thank you. I was curious about how the young students felt about the piece being ephemeral. That's always such a hard thing for me to even wrap my head around. How did they feel about the fact that it was going to go away? Yeah, um, they, it was K-4, so they're, they're still pretty young to understanding vocabulary. So they were just really excited that it was going to be outside. I'm not, it, was, it was pretty exciting for them, I think, just that they got to use different outside materials. But um, I, we, we talked a lot about the vocabulary with ephemeral, and they were very interested in it. They love things, at least my class, they love anything to do with outside or just materials outside. And they, I even like showed them, you know, when a leaf and it blows away, I showed them, look, it was, it was kind of a windy day too. So I showed them, you know, we held leaves out and we let them blow away. And so I tried to explain to them the best way possible what ephemeral is, but they, they loved it. They were really excited about it. Very cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That is wonderful. I bet that was a fun day. <laughs> yeah, it was super fun. And it was, it was, uh, I think, when did I do it? Like, I think beginning of November. Um, and I was really worried that it was going to be cold out because we had this, you know, strict deadlines that we had to do for, we had, we had a sign up sheet of when we were going to do our lesson. And I was super worried it was going to be cold out that day because it was November, but it was like beautiful out. So it was just pure luck that it was so nice out that day. I was so happy. <laughs> It was really fun though. I had a really good time with them. I was wondering if you, do you ever like make your own yarn or like dye your own yarn for these pieces? Yeah, so I, I totally forgot to mention that with the, um, the pieces I'm currently working on that series, I um, I really, I spin my own yarn a lot of the time and I have been working with spinning yarn for quite a while now, for about a year. I use a drop spindle and now I'm working with, um, it's like this 3D printed e-spinner that I got online, which is, it's handy. It does it a lot faster than it helps my hands a lot more. But um, so I've been able to consistently spin more yarn and I really wanted to work with um, using my own hand spun yarn and my weavings. And so the most recent pieces, those smaller um, pieces I just showed that um, the series, I'm doing mostly, I think only my hand spun yarn in those pieces. I forgot to mention that, <laughs> but yeah, I, I've only, I've done natural dyeing before. I, I've learned how to do acid dyeing, but um, it's, it's a hard process that I, it's lovely that we have that dye lab at UWM in the fourth floor, but um, I've done acid dyeing once before, but I've done mostly natural dyeing, but yes, I have hand spun yarn though. Any other questions? Okay. We will move on to the next artist. Thank you all. So next artist, Lucy. Hello, everyone. I'm a third year painting and drawing student and I have a focus in printmaking as well. And I'd like to begin my talk um, it kind of chronologically going through the main phases that I've gone through because I consider myself someone who 
goes through kind of extreme phases and they all kind of play together like anyone. But um, with the next slide, um, I'd like to start with my main influence. Um, when I was a kid, Wang Yanni, um, who is most well known for these large scale playful monkey paintings of these kind of personified monkeys and animals or landscapes. And um, why I included her is because she was the one who kind of gave me the authority to um, pursue my first line of work when I was in like early elementary school, which were these kind of playful takes of her monkeys still, um, but doing more Midwestern American things um, with these kind of intense captions, I'd say. Um, so for the next slide, I did include some of my early work when I was maybe um, nine or 10. Um, it was a book full of these faces, pretty simple and minimal color and everything. But um, this was my kind of way of um, being real, even though I was a kid and kind of trying to catch on that I, I get these universal things, even though I felt kind of patronized as a kid. So the one on the left, really intense. Um, it says, the eyes that I remember, no eyes look like these. I know who these eyes belong to, with two spelled wrong. But um, I, I still consider these important. And I still consider myself someone who who's looking out for the kids. Because I remember what that was like. And even for young people, as I'm an undergrad, and I kind of feel a similar you know, dislike towards all of that. Um, so for the next slide, please. Um, this was a piece in, I guess, the kind of series I started, I'd say kind of Freudian and keeping with that same intensity I had as a kid, but using much more analytical pieces, um, like the, using Freudian dream elements. Um, in, in depicting these kind of universal scenes again to kind of relate myself. Um, but this is actually kind of a mundane little trauma of seeing my ex-boyfriend driving by delivering pizzas. Um, and I, so I used all of these elements that were really an intense and kind of altering pers perspective and all really intentional to kind of create the strangeness of that moment, even though it might seem like it wasn't all that great. Um, so the next slide, I included one more of those. Um, and this one a little bit more self-aware of the cliche nature of including all these elements, like I have the White Stripes, the Beatles, um, Frida Kahlo, all these pop culture things that I, I'm aware are a little bit cliche, but instead of getting on myself, using the art as a way of being objective about that and kind of just going all in into that interesting cliche nature. And another breakup pandemic scene um, is what this kind of is. Um, so if you could move to the next slide. From there, I, I wanted to kind of, I guess both do a coming of age paintings or drawing charcoal drawing this is um, since I was in a pandemic and um, had just finished reading the James Joyce novel, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and kind of doing my take on that and in a little bit of a subtle feminist take as well is just kind of the strangeness that comes with being a young girl and being nude and being in a pandemic in a new city um, and kind of just putting myself all out there because um, it, it felt like I wanted to, and I had to kind of figure out why. So from there, my artwork kind of moved into a, a purpose of processing things and figuring myself out, especially in this introspective time in the pandemic. So for the next slide, um, I went more towards the neurotic um, phase, I, I guess you could call it. Um, and using a lot of my main reference references as these neurotic videos I would take when I was recovering from an eating disorder. Um, I, would, I was gaining weight and I would take these videos of myself since I forgot what I looked like and I couldn't tell what was real anymore and what I looked like. So I would just 
take these videos of me just kind of walking around doing normal things or undressing and dressing again. And I mean, it started as a place of just embarrassment and I would never show this to anybody and didn't intend to be a reference, um, but it became interesting. So I went into that. So um, the one on the left is a screen print, which I just kind of liked how the, the little accident happened there. And the, there's still the static feel and the weaving I have in um, Crossing Over uses this reference as well. And on the right, combining those kind of um, symbolic Frida Kahlo-ish elements with that intense um, reference of these neurotic videos. And um, the one on the right became this just intense kind of like storm that it is to be in what it was to be in my room and realizing that my chronic pain of my hip like the eating disorder were kind of things that would just keep bubbling up and never really going away because I had this black and white way of like I thought you would just get surgery and be healed um so that was like me kind of relating those things um, while also altering the perspective and doing some weird things with paint. Um, so for the next one, um, this is my more recent work and it's pretty much finished, but um, the great thing about art school is that I've been kind of forced to do a lot of self-portraits. Um, so it's gotten, it's allowed me to kind of document how I feel, I suppose. And uh, so this one, a self-portrait of just Gestalt, um, it began as a kind of um, experiment as using myself as this test subject for, for painting with the washy layers of oil paint. Um, but it became this kind of reserved portrait of myself in, in comparison with the nudes where I would just kind of out there. And I think I, I'm just kind of reaching a kind of calmness so I think it's cool that that's kind of reflected in this painting. And I also was really excited with how these little shapes and weird objects and junk that I have in my room and even my face all became kind of abstracted, but I know what everything is. Um, so I can piece everything together. So the more you know me, the more kind of gestalt you have in seeing the whole of me. Uh, so for the next one, I included this paper study I did just because it shows how I am kind of moving into playfulness with paint. And this is kind of where I am naturally. And especially as a jazz musician, improvisation and being able to shift and use art as play is also really major. Um, and that's why this is more about movement and color than it really really was of being the strict photographic interpretation of paper. So for the next one, I'd also like to acknowledge my kind of, um, I guess, modern day um, romanticism of, of everyday kind of Midwestern scenes. Um, so the one on the right basement was just painting this basement that we would all hang out in and kind of monument monumentalizing that with the skateboard ramp in the back and the, the drum set and everything and just how the basement is kind of strange and unique and not everyone knows that the basement is the hangout spot but I, I just wanted to make a painting about it and the one on the left um, a, a bit from a, a much larger painting um, which just again about space and the weird yellow hallway and the romantic loneliness of it all. And for the next slide, please. Um, I just included a little bit of my photography just to show kind of where my work is headed and um, in being objective, not only about myself, but also about people around me and my interest in people around me and that being my parents and them and their retirements and these kind of little changes. And hopefully one day I'd like to paint something more photographic like this, or at least use, using these references. 
So for the another one, the next slide, um, I included just a few more of those to um, to show that a little bit more. And for the last slide, I have um, just I wanted to end a little more playfully on this portrait of my my Italian boss, who I I, I just like painting people that are great, um, and uh, the community and gifting this to him was pretty cool. And I think it's another part of my work that's pretty important. That's all. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Questions? And feel free to leave them in the chat as well. I just have a comment. Um, I really enjoy how you capture kind of the emotions of a person and like of the moment in each of your pieces, especially like with this one on the screen of your Italian boss, you can almost like, you can like tell his personality just from looking at this, you know, and just like why you'd want to paint him. So I think that's super cool. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that him walking around with the live lobster was just a good moment of him being wild, like he always is at the restaurant. I loved seeing the way that your figurative interests translated into the piece that you have in the show, the fibers piece. Um, that was, it's such a beautiful and kind of mysterious piece and I loved the fact that you showed that you sort of created an object with with the with the weaving. Um, it became this very spatially spatially interesting in a similar way to your paintings. If that Thank makes you. sense, yeah. yeah, yeah. The mirror piece was was a fun uh, addition for space. I know in your um, artist statement, you said you were inspired by Edward Hopper a lot, um, which I definitely feel like I noticed in the Yellow Hallway piece. Um, I don't know if that piece was necessarily inspired by his work, but um, I feel like it, I don't know, something about it, just like the loneliness aspect, like you mentioned, and the colors kind of really reminded me a lot of his work. Thank you. That was my main influence for that painting. The, my most hopperish painting. I'm glad you picked that up, especially the loneliness and the weird mono, monotone space. Yeah, your your paintings are just like super incredible. I don't have any questions and I don't have a lot to say about it other than just like, wow. And I like how hard you lean into like, like darkness in some of your um emotive pieces I just think that's really um it's like I get like feeling like you have to you just have to do it um but it also is like brave and then also showing it um and like bearing what that means to you is like it's really awesome thank you No more questions, we'll move on. Um, okay, so the next part is that will be presenting Sally. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm Sally. I'm a BFA jewelry and metals student, as well as a digital fabrication and design student here. Um, I also listed my Instagram. If you guys want to follow me there, you can go on to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to kind of dive into like my background and kind of like where my inspiration for my work comes from. Um, but Starting off with these two images, um, these are like me at a really young age. I've always been like really obsessed with fashion and 
wearing like these interesting outfits and accessorizing um and wearing just like pretty much any pattern you can combine um similar to what I dress like today you can go to the next slide um, and then here's some more pictures from my childhood during a lot of my summer I spent a lot of time on the east coast with my grandparents um, on the left my grandpa George and my grandma Charlotte uh, I contribute a lot of my inspiration from them, specifically with my grandma. She has an exquisite style and she has so much clothing and hundreds of pairs of shoes and some of it's into my own collection now. But a lot of those summers, we would often go to New York um, to go shopping and to go to various plays and shows and eat a lot of good food. And New York has just always been a place that I've been really fascinated with. Um, this picture on the right is the first time I ever went to New York at six years old. Um, my dad is actually from there. So it's kind of always had a place in my heart and is a place I definitely want to move to at some point in my life. And yeah, even though my grandpa isn't no longer around, he passed away about two years ago. Um, I always go back to these images from my childhood. I have this whole box of pictures when I went on vacations with them when I was younger uh, we would go on like road trips for a couple of weeks I would spend like months at a time with them um, but I often go back to those pictures when I go through creative blocks in my art um, next slide so my first art experience was at a really young age um, my parents always worked a lot um, they weren't really around um, during the summer and we would often my brother and I go to like art camp um we would do like day camps did college for kids at UWM for a really long time too um but this first picture on the right is my first art thing I've ever won I won an art contest for drawing a picture of the Easter bunny um and I won this big stuffed animal Easter bunny um but my parents have always been super supportive of my brother and I and always pushing us to pursue art because um, my dad has some art experience. Um, even though both my parents aren't artists, they are very supportive of it and for support me being creative. Um, but then this picture on the left is of my first childhood um, pet. Her name is Trixie. Um, she's like a source of inspiration of my current body of work because we often fed her cheese and she eventually was got super overweight and yeah she passed away um really early on in my life but she kind of inspires me along with my family um and just memories like that um so you can go to the next slide um so diving a little bit more into my work and my process i've been exploring this process for the past couple months now um, I'm primarily made jewelry up until this point, but I started this new process because I was kind of bored of that. I was kind of burnt out. Um, and I kind of just came up with this weird idea one day, like what would happen if I put cheese onto a laser cutter? Um, and I kind of did some research online about if that's been like done before. And it definitely was done before, but not in the way that I wanted to use it in my art and I kind of had to figure settings out on the laser of how to make this work um, but last semester I had the privilege of doing a classroom assistant um, ship research assistantship excuse me with Adam Hawk and I started learning more about laser cutting processes and orientation on the laser to get like patterns into certain places which is something I explored on metal up until this point but wanted to take it into this new medium. Um, so this photo on the right is kind of outlining that like grid process. Um, you can cut a bunch of stuff. Um, it's just like a paper template. Um, but yeah, you can go to the next slide now. Um, and then this is just some more experimentation. This picture on the left is when I first started cutting string cheese. Similarly, this grid fashion, I could get these patterns that I just illustrated on Rhino into the piece, but um, I've been doing a lot more experimenting with this process, um, and I've been 
taking some of these pieces and making them larger. This piece on the right is part of my senior capstone project. Um, I've been taking the cheese and putting it into vacuum sealed bags and sewing it together um, to try to protect the longevity of it because it is a material that has a high shelf life before it goes to the laser, but after it kind of changes that. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, but these pieces are process shots of my senior capstone work um, that's going to be up at the Chem of Earth in a gallery starting next Wednesday. I didn't include any pictures of what they finally look like, but that's for you guys to go check out. Um, but yeah, this process has been super interesting to me because I've been taking them out of the original sealed individually and putting them together um, to see them slowly like shrink morph um some of them are molding um and just seeing how it changes over time um you can go to the next slide and this is my work that is in the crossing over show so the cheese that i used in both these pieces has a polyurethane furniture varnish over it um i kind of was playing around with how to seal the cheese to last for a really long time. And a lot of that comes from the fact my parents have been hanging onto a piece of pizza for before I've been born. Um, but that's what my parents used on that piece. Um, it kind of has a funny meaning. Like my dad went to a basketball game and like had one of the basketball players sign the box. And I guess he like ate off the pizza and yeah, now it's just been sitting in my basement for like 40 years, but it's kind of a source of inspiration for how this piece started because I really like working with absurd materials and just weird art. Um, but yeah, these pieces like are pretty much rock hard at this point. The cheese is so sealed and I've had these pieces for the past few months and it was sitting out all summer in the sun um on my bench at school and it's still okay but yeah these are just from my capstone work last semester and I really enjoyed how they looked on the wall in the gallery um you can go to the next slide so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I got into the crossing over show and kind of my experience the past couple of years here at UWM um so the reason I was even in the show in the first place was because of the service award I won in the Makers 22 show last spring. Um, last year, I served as the president of Object, which opened a lot of doors for me. Um, I helped assist visiting artists, um, coordinate events, and taking the lead on a lot of projects, uh, which has also opened the door up to go to Haystack School of Crafts next summer and assist Rachel Kettinger in one of her workshops. But for me, it was super important after COVID, to start bringing people back together um, because I initially felt like for a while I didn't have a community at UWM and community really in general. Um, I lost a lot of friends in college and a lot of friends like throughout my life. So I kind of wanted to start over and start something new. Um, you can go to the next slide. So here's some more pictures of my little community here at UWM and a picture of me um, a couple weeks at the craft show. But being a part of community has been like a huge part of my life. Um, I've always really wanted to become a part of something. I feel like I'm important in a group of people. And um, right before COVID, I had the opportunity to go to Eastern Carolina's University's Material Topics Symposium, which was my first look into this bigger community that metalsmithing is. And the metals program has made it way easier to be a part of a community because we all are very open people and have a lot of different experiences. And it's been really cool for us all to come together um, and make it more enjoyable to be, enjoyable to be at school. But yeah, I just want to take some time and talk about that because it's been a long journey for me at UWM. It's crazy to think starting four years ago, almost five years ago at this point, that 
my work started as photography and I took a metals class really early on in my college experience and although I don't work in metal primarily I feel like um my skills I learned in metal smithing really helped me get to the point where I started laser cutting on this cheese and working with really weird materials um and the professors have been super supportive so I can only thank them enough um but as I'm in my last few weeks here at UWM I've been taking time to reflect on memories I've had here and I'm just super grateful for every opportunity that's came my way and all my professors, Jim, Yav, Erica, Adam, Chad, and some of my friends that are here too. Um, this journey definitely couldn't have been the same without my friends and my family and making cool work. So thank you guys. That's all I have. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any like current plans to explore any different types of foods and laser cutting or? At the moment, no, but I think it would be really cool to keep pushing this within different food. Um, the reason I've stuck with cheese for this long is because just like the memories again of like being with my dog and um I I went to this Girl Scout camp when I was way younger and um the whole week we had to like think about or we had to go by like a fake nickname and I chose the name Cheese for whatever <laughs> reason and that's just kind of where this work has just been sitting for right now um but I do think it would be cool to do different food and see what happens yeah I was just imagining it's like a really fun like series of a bunch of different types of foods like being like orange peels or something could be really cool yeah any other questions um i i just uh wanted to say like the absurd the absurdity of the cheese does like it it like when I saw that at crossing over I was obsessed like I couldn't um I kept pulling people over there and being like this is cheese um so yeah I think I think leaning into making weird stuff um is always the way to go so I love it thank you yeah, thank you all for joining. I know Linda's here. Hi, Linda. <laughs> really lovely work, Sally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. We will move on. Our next artist is Dora. Hello, I'm Dora, um, and that's me. I am a uh, primarily a painting and drawing major, but my secondary focus is in printmaking. And then I also really like working in other medias, especially fibers. Um, it's really fun for me. Um, I've been in school for, I think this is going into five years. I did my first two years of undergrad out at University of Denver and then two years ago moved back to Milwaukee during the pandemic and I've been at UWM ever since. Um, yeah, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, <laughs> a lot of my work takes place in bathrooms. That's kind of, that's kind of my stage. Um, and 
I use them to represent queer experiences primarily. I think that bathrooms are kind of an inherently important queer space um, because they're where um, like people craft their identities and where you can add and remove and alter your body. It's frequently where a lot of queer people experience that sort of exploration. Um, and especially I feel like it's a place where we grapple with how we're perceived by others and how we're perceived by ourselves. And um, we use that as a form of self-exploration. Uh, so we can go to the next one. This is my piece called Preening, which is a woodcut and it is also a bathroom <laughs> related piece. Um, I like to show communal scenes in bathrooms because while it's not like an exclusively queer experience, um, I think that exploration um, of like the portrayal of our bodies and uh, cutting each other's hair and dyeing hair and piercing and tattooing is kind of for many people something that is an important group experience. Um, and another thing I really like about wood cutting and uh, relief printing in general is that process of um, reduction and cutting for me mirrors um, a lot of the processes of altering the body as well. And I like having that kind of transcending the process to the final piece. Uh, and go to the next slide. Um, and this is one of my fibers pieces. This is um, a weaving that is called Severance, Severance One. There's gonna be another one of these. Um, and <clears throat> also continuing the theme of body alterations and queer exploration. Uh, I did this piece when I cut off all my hair um, and I actually sometimes, I usually pair this piece with my own hair because <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> and uh, I like the way that the fibers of the weaving kind of mirror that um, and process wise in a similar way to how wood cutting mirrors body alteration. I like how fibers and that feels like that a lot to me as well. Um, also, another reason I've been drawn to fibers is because it has that history of bringing textiles and crafts into a fine art space, um, because for so long, the exclusion of textiles and crafts um, prevented many communities, women, people of color, working class people from entering fine art spaces and being included in them. Um, and I think it makes this a really good way to explore uh, queer experiences in art spaces. Um, yeah, I mean, go to the next one. And this is another one of that in the Severance series. I hope to make more of these. These are the two that I have right now. This one is clipping toenails. Um, I do also have a lot of toenails from various people because um, I think including the actual body parts with my work is um, helps to add that materiality to it. Um, yeah, you can go to the next one. This piece is a lino cut, also a relief print. Uh, it's called Me and the Guy Inside My Head. Um, and I find there to be a lot of inherent overlap between queerness and existentialism um, in terms of the exploration of identity and the exploration of sense of self and understanding self versus community and like being perceived and like perceiving yourself. Um, for me, those things really go together and kind of bleed into each other a lot of times. Um, so while this piece isn't explicitly something that might be read as queer, I identify it very much as a queer piece as I do with the rest of my more existential pieces. Um, and go to the next one. Uh, and going off of that, this one I feel similarly about. Um, 
It is called No Sleep for Baby. It's a woodcut that I have painted on and sewn into, um, which again, for me, really carries those ideas of altering the body. Um, this paper has been dyed uh, and dyeing my hair has been an uh, important part of self-exploration and perception of myself. Um, and it also kind of starts the exploration of a new space, which is the bedroom space as a place of self-exploration. Uh, but that's a whole other <laughs> discussion. Uh, we can go to the next one. Um, oh, and this brings us to this piece, The Five Fates Grooming. This one for me really represented kind of an unexpected turning point in the way I view my work and the way other I experience the way other people view my work and kind of the relationship between those two things. Um, I once had ex had someone critique this and say that it didn't read as queer. Um, which was kind of shocking to me at the time because in my head it felt like inherently all of my work should be understood as queer because I'm a queer artist and that's just the lens that I produce through constantly um and it really kind of reminded me of the concept of separating the art from the artist um which I think has been used to erase queer people from art history um, time and time again, because uh, I think I'm inherently part of my work and I don't think you can separate art from the identity of the artist. Um, and much of the reason I think this was not viewed as um, being read as queer is because of the way it mirrors classical compositions uh, with the multiple figures and the way they interact with each other. Um, but similar to the separating art from the artist, we forget that Donatello and Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and Albert Dürer were all queer people. Um, and even though we choose to just say that as kind of a fun factoid attached to their Catholic art, uh, it's their exploration of figure and human form that did come from queer people. Uh, and they've been there for throughout history and a lot of the exploration of the figure and the canon of figurative painting has been done by queer people. Um, so we can go to the next one. This is another piece just called Bathing um, that I did along that same vein. Um, and I feel like as artists, uh, very early on, we're kind of told that if people don't perceive our art as we intended it, it's considered a failure on our part, um, which I think it's important to learn that you have to um, know that other people aren't necessarily going to um, see your work exactly as you intended it to be viewed. But it also assumes that we create work to fit into a common uh, narrative, a common usually heteronormative narrative. Um, and it, that experience especially kind of made me understand that there's always, there's gonna be a dissonance between the symbolisms and patterns um, that I use in my work and the canon that people are pulling from in order to understand it. Um, so, and I think the next thing I'm kind of pursuing with my work is trying to harness that dissonance between how others see my work versus the reality of its production um, and to reflect viewers' perception of my work back onto them and make them wonder why they bring the things that they do to my pieces. Um, and that brings it back to bathrooms because <laughs> I think that's a space where the um, perception of self and thinking about the way others will perceive you kind of meet. Um, you can go to the last slide. And that is it. And that's my Instagram um, where my work can be viewed and also commissioned, purchased, and I can be contacted through there as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, I just want to say that uh, I think that how much you like your your point on like not being able to separate the art from the artist and like your work being made through a queer lens is like a really good like point to make because I mean even though other people like aren't always going to perceive it that way like that is like the lens in which you are creating it and it just um I just I see it in all of your work and I think like at least I read it that way so um yeah I yeah I really liked um you talking about that thanks Cole I really love, I really love the use of bathrooms and bathroom time in your pieces and it just made me think like I'd never thought of it before, but like as a gay trans man, I love the bathroom and like <laughs> nice. the bathroom has always been like a place where I can like look at and connect with like my body, you know, and mm -hmm. that's like really a really interesting topic. And I really appreciate that you are like highlighting that. And I agree with Cole where like um, I do definitely view your pieces as queer for sure. I think it reads that way. Thank you. Yeah, I think for me, the bathroom, definitely another reason why it feels like an important place is because it's like that intersection of um, like the removal of society's views of your body and kind of raw, unbiased human experience. And then also like simultaneously a place for self-exploration. I think I think bathrooms can also kind of represent like a place of self-care. And I think that's really cool with like the idea of it being like it being like a queer exploration space and also like where you take care of things. Um, take care of my business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. <laughs> she didn't know the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think it's um, really funny that a painting with all those nude women hanging around together with their bodies overlapping so comfortable um, would not be viewed as at all queer. I yeah, mean, and yet we seem to have a canon of art history that yeah. Right. Kind of has Ooh, we need to reassess i think so you guys are crazy those are clearly just a sleepover where a bunch of friends are hanging out with each other in the back Best friends. Someone stole right. the locker room scene from carrie yeah <laughs> <laughs> which looks so homoerotic mm. yeah <laughs> anyway beautiful work yeah i also love your um the font that you're using with your 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 branding thank you Very um beautiful i i love i love some good typefaces mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. i really liked your um, kind of short conversation on how different crafts have been historically perceived as like um not a fine art um, and that's something i've been really exploring in the master's thesis a lot um and your piece with the weaving that, that you said you present with your hair um, i thought was so interesting um, and it reminded me a lot of how like victorian women would often collect um hair from loved ones and put it in an album. Um, I thought there was a lot of, if my thesis is kind of exploring Victorian album making. Oh, cool. So um, I loved seeing that connection. Yeah, because I know like there was the like Victorian, like keeping hair in lockets and things like that too. Yeah, so I, I saw like kind of a lot of those themes. Mm -hmm. Any final comments?
Nice. Move on to our last artist. Um, the last artist of the night is Cole. Hi. <laughs> Um, after seeing all these presentations, I kind of wish I had included more of my other work than just this. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> um, this is my presentation on my kaleidoscopes. Um, <laughs> you can go to the next slide. Um, this is me um, and a self-portrait I did last year in drawing two, uh, or yeah, no, this I did in drawing one, but anyway, um, yeah, so I primarily worked, well worked in 2D like mediums up until last spring. Um, I actually won the first year program scholarship last year. I'm so I'm technically a second year art student, um, even though this is my third year here at UWM. Um, but last spring I took 3D concepts and I um, found out that I really liked working in uh, like the round and like 3D spaces. So even though I enjoy, I really enjoy making 2D work, um, I have found like 3D work to be kind of freeing in a less, uh, it's like, it's, it can be really technical to make things uh, like building things, but it also is less objective uh, visually in a way. Um, I don't know, but anyway, you can move on to the next slide. Um, so last year at some point I found like this world of like artisanal kaleidoscope makers. I, I, I had seen and played with kaleidoscopes as a kid and I always loved them. I still have like a couple of toy kaleidoscopes from when I was a kid, but I didn't know that kaleidoscopes had this like, um, soup, like there was this level of like high craftsmanship and like heirloom like um, pieces. Um, and so I found artists such as um, Colby Scope, uh, and this is one of his kaleidoscopes, these three images are all uh, photos of the same one. Um, but so I had found these last year and I was fascinated. Um, I couldn't pay to buy one and I didn't know how they were made, but I kind of had that in my back pocket. And so when I was in 3D concepts last spring, our final project was to make a wood game. And I asked if I could make a wood wooden toy and I was able to do that so um, you can move on to the next slide so that I decided to take the time to make my final as a time to research or at least attempt to figure out how collect like fancy kaleidoscopes were made um, I didn't quite get there with this one but so this is the outside of it and I'm really happy with how the carving um, had turned out and I hope to return to making my kaleidoscopes um, and just more like wood um, pieces and wooden like car hand like carved pieces because this was really cool for me. Um, but you can move on to the next slide. So if you can think back to a couple slides ago with the image that I showed you of like what inspired me, you, this is the inside of my first kaleidoscope. This obviously is not um, what I had hoped it would be. Um, and it kind of drove me nuts. I was like cleaning this mirror over and over and over, like trying to get it to look right while I was making my final for 3D concepts. And it just never, it was never gonna get there. I figured out I was using the wrong kind of mirror. Um, so yeah, like I used a house mirror that I got at Goodwill, which mirrors that hang on the wall have the glass on top and it interferes with the reflection. Um, I couldn't, I didn't have enough time to like replace like my whole, material um, before finishing the project. So this is what I made, but this was right at the end of the spring. And so I decided to take the extra time that I had during the summer outside of working to um, keep exploring with glass and mirrors. And so you can move on to the next slide. 
So this is my second kaleidoscope. Um, and it is made out of stained glass on the outside, which I learned how to do on YouTube. Um, surprisingly, there's not a lot of information on like YouTube about making kaleidoscopes. I, I mean, out of everything you can like Google and like YouTube, it was like a little bit difficult to figure some things out, but I actually ended up buying a book um, and stuff. So, uh, and the thing on the end of this kaleidoscope is basically a crystal ball. It's called a spherical collimating lens, but um, it basically just distorts what you're looking at and like shrinks it and uh, like what you're looking at through it. So this is technically a telescope, like a telescope. Um, it reflects what you look at it, um, look at it with. So you can move to the next slide. And so this is the inside of that one. And I'm getting closer to some like what I'm was going for. Um, and so now you can move on to the next one. Um, so this is my third kaleidoscope. Um, it has since kind of broken a little bit. The mirrors I didn't really secure well enough. So I actually might take it apart just for the material because it. Uh, I used a lot of really beautiful glass on the inside of this. Um, and I kind of want it back since it's broken. But anyway, um, you can move on to the next slide. And so this is my most, my favorite kaleidoscope and my most recent normal kaleidoscope. Um, I say normal because I made a giant one, which is what is in crossing over. Um, but so this one um, I'm really, really proud of. And um, you can kind of see it in this photo on the like outside edges of the, of the inside, there's like etchings. So I was able, I'm able to like, etch into the mirrors. And when you shine a flashlight on the outside, I use um, semi-transparent stained glass. So the light can come through and it just creates this like incredibly uh, wonderful um, spacious like effect. Um, and you can move on to the next slide. And so this is my giant kaleidoscope, which is in crossing over. Um, I named it after the model of a TV that I took apart to get the mirrors out of. Um, old rear projection TVs have the front surface mirrors, the ones that are correct for making such a thing. So um, yeah, this, I actually started making this giant thing before considering putting it in the show. I just wanted to see if I could, because I wanted to make something that was like a window, like not, not like a scope, but more like a, just like an opening into like a new space. Um, I think why I'm, I've become like transfixed on kaleidoscopes and kaleidoscopes is like, I really like taking myself like, out of a moment and like kaleidoscopes are just like, and particularly telescopes, because it changes exactly where you, you're, where you're looking is a whole new thing. And it's, um, it also kind of like makes whatever is around you like beautiful in a way that you might not have been experiencing before looking through it. Um, so I'm just leaning into like making these right now. I'm still working on a lot of different kinds of work. I'm in a jewelry class. Um, I'm actually, uh, my final includes a tiny kaleidoscope at the end of a necklace. But anyway, <laughs> I um, yeah, I'm still working in 2D and I'm um, really enjoying figure drawing right now. Um, my self-portrait at the beginning, I, I love drawing photorealistic or semi-photorealistic portraits and stuff. Um, but yeah, so I've just really been having fun with making these and I would love to answer any questions anybody has about it. I just want to say that I love your dedication to research about different materials for this because I never knew this much about kaleidoscopes until just right now. So that was crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's been a few months. It took a little while. I now sound kind of crazy when I'm explaining it to people, but <laughs> thank you. I love it. I think it's super cool. And I just, I love them. I think that they look great on the outside and the inside. 
My question um, is what is like the pattern made out of? Like, is it little glass or beads? Like, do you just kind of find it or do you make them? Um, yeah, so for this and the last kaleidoscope, they both, so the other, the other ones, or basically all of them have that spherical lens on the end, which I bought those on eBay, um, which I don't know, I should have bought more because like they don't really exist. Like, I don't know how to find more. I will um, at some point, but um, those spherical things I bought, but then I, the like on this one, like the rainbow glass, it's a dichroic glass. And I also bought the glass on Etsy, but I've, I, for this one and, and the last one, I cut them into specific like shapes. So um, at the end of this giant kaleidoscope is a clear rectangular glass box that I made um, out of like stained glass processes. And inside it is like probably like a hundred little triangles and rectangles of the dichroic glass that I cut. And I um, sculpturally uh, faceted them together with different kinds of like, uh, glue um, and then sealed it inside this box that I made out of glass. And so um, it, it's in, I make the end ending pieces like intentional, but I, um, and I want to explore more like materials and like processes to be like uh, deliberate in what happens at the end of the scope. But for now it's been more like just like exploring um, like the randomness and like the color of like the glass that I have, but I've been, I cut them into specific pieces and stuff, so. I'm so you know, excited to see what you make next because every time you make a new kaleidoscope, I just never know what you're about to show me. It's always just like, insanely intricate in some new way that I couldn't imagine um like this one is just like a it, it looks like it came out of space <laughs> and I'm excited to see what you do if with new materials and yeah they just keep getting better it's an asteroid from space made out of a tv from 1999 <laughs> Do you ever consider like the audience interaction with these pieces and like that connection? Yeah, well, that's that's what I was so excited about with this giant one was like, I just, uh, I really wanted like, I, I had like the most fun, almost like one of the most fun times of my life watching people play with this at the opening for Crossing Over. Um, and I was like looking forward to that. I um, I, I actually ne had not originally come up with a plan for presenting the giant scope because I just started making the thing without really an idea of like why I just wanted to see if I could make one that big. But then I had to think about how people were gonna interact with it. And this was like a huge like obstacle, to, like making that stand that it goes on. I, it ended up being like a really simple and elegant solution that I came to, but it took me a really long time, like weeks of me freaking out about how to make this stand um, so that it's at an angle so that like anybody can just look at it, um, just like glance down. Um, of course, the like three foot tall, like children that came to Crossing Over had to get picked up to look in it. But um, for the most part, yeah, I really considered like accessibility and also the interaction that people would have with it. Um, that's why this, like the slide, uh, thing, the rainbow thing at the end, I like made it longer than I probably would have because I wanted people to be able to like really like play with it um, as much as they wanted to. Um, so yeah. Yeah, cool work. I love, I loved looking at it. <laughs> Thank you. There's been a lot of people come into the gallery and just their faces get so joyful. Um, they're they, they all love it. Thank you. 
you think you're going to try to make, um, like, try to go bigger than this, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. The TV, the TV mirrors that I, like, the mirrors I pull out of these TVs are, like, three, like, three, at least, like, three feet long um, and maybe, like, two feet tall. So, like, I know I can go bigger. Um, so I probably will. <laughs> I'm also thinking of, like, one that, like, kind of hangs from a ceiling, like, the ceiling, like a periscope situation um because then that would truly end all like height discrepancy discrepancy problems because it would like be able to yeah anyway yes <laughs> well i'm excited to see what you come up with next or how you kind of push this idea a little more thank you Any final questions or any questions for any of the artists that presented? Or comments? I just I just want to say I think I think you all did a really great job. Um, it was very, very fun to see your work and to hear you talk about it. And thank you, Haley, for, for hosting. Sorry, our dog is chewing a bone underneath the table here. So <laughs> loud noise but um yeah you guys make us proud oh thanks yeah it was just awesome to go to the crossing over show and see all the fantastic work that everybody's been doing um and you know as an alum i'm i'm one of your biggest cheerleaders all of you go uwm <laughs> Yeah, it's been, it's been really great um, seeing how everybody who's come into the gallery has reacted to all of your art. Um, people are really loving the show and have expressed a lot of um, like excitement about what all of you are doing. If nobody has any further comments, um, wrap up for the night um you can always message any of the artists who presented tonight if you have any further questions um thank you all for coming this was really is great to hear about all of your pieces and i want to thank everybody for again thank everybody for all of their support and all of the artists who are in the show um yeah, a wonderful night Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, Haley. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. I know the, the work of dealing with the gallery is like a ton. So you're doing <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Beautiful install. Mm -hmm. Really. Mm -hmm. yep. Beautiful show. Mm -hmm. Thanks, all. Night. Thank you. Oh, here we go.